This is a horror podcast, and as a result, it will have some horror in it. You may find that horror too disturbing. Don't worry, this ride is one you can get off at any time. Just press stop if it's getting to you. The fun armor at Old Man Jenkins' World of Fun and Death, that's not a ride you can get off, and honestly not one we would recommend you get on. Pseudopod, episode 694, for March 20, 2020. This week's story, Robin's Wrath, by Marjorie Lawrence. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm your host, Graham Dunlop. Today's story was first published in Hutchison's Story Magazine, November 1923, and was written by Marjorie Lawrence. Her best-known supernatural works include Number 7 Queer Street, a collection that gathers the case histories of an occult detective, Dr. Miles Penoyer, as related by his assistant, Jerome Latimer. Lawrence stated that this series was inspired by Algernon Blackwood's John Silence stories and Dion Fortune's Dr. Taverner series. Like Mae Sinclair before her, Lawrence became a confirmed spiritualist and believer in reincarnation in later years. According to the author, My interest in it dates actually from the moment when I saw a near relation three nights after he died, when he gave me specific instructions about the finding of a box containing important papers. They were found precisely where he said, and from that moment I became deeply interested in what I have called the other side. Somewhere that man was obviously still alive. Somewhere he was thinking of us, anxious to help, caring what happened. In a word, he was still alive somewhere, and I was determined to find out where. Your reader is Lewis Davies. Lewis Davies is an ex-actor turned history teacher. You can follow him at Lewis Kerno on Twitter. He's always looking for opportunities to read aloud. Links will be in the show notes. And now we have a story for you. And we promise you, it's true. Robin's Wrath by Marjorie Lawrence Narrated by Lewis Davis So you're gonna buy Robin's Wrath, young lady? Ellen Vandermill raised her arch brows with a touch of hauteur at the old man's tone, not the daughter of a hundred earls, but of one immensely wealthy pork-packer, who could deny her nothing, even to the purchase of Gill Hall. She had, as have so many American women of bourgeois birth, the tiny feet and delicate complexion that is generally considered the heritage of the aristocrat alone. Now she tapped a smart brogue shoe with an equally smart cane as she answered old Giles's question with a little note of asperity in her voice. Of course I am. I have. It goes with Gill Hall. Besides, when I get a path made, it will make a perfect shortcut to the golf links. There was a sudden stir and rustle among the group of villagers. With one accord they looked at old Giles, and there was a pointed little silence. Flushing with annoyance, Ellen glanced from one face to another. Her one wish was to get on well with the villagers of this tiny, lovely village, Gillock, which seemed to live in the shelter of the old manor-house, Gill Hall, for centuries the seat of the Ruddocks, and now passing, like so many other many-memoried old houses, into the hands of the stranger. An only child, her father wax in her hands, the pretty, spoilt American beauty had passed through Gillock only once on a motor tour, and seeing the wonderful old house set in miles of green woods and meadows and fields had given her father no peace till he offered to buy it for her, much as he would have endeavoured to buy the moon had she wanted it. The grounds ran down to a narrow belt of woodland, thick with undergrowth, the tangling green luxuriance that had never known shears or pruning knife. Robin's Wrath. Beyond lay the golf links, within easy walking distance of the hall when the path mentioned should be cut. Certainly it seemed a good idea, and there was some reason for Ellen's puzzled annoyance at the sudden silence that greeted her remark. 
even the landlord of the picturesque inn, the goose with the golden eggs, lounging in the shadow of his own doorway to listen to the gossip under the great elm tree outside, put down his mug of beer and stared at her curiously. She spoke sharply, addressing old Giles, whose heavy white brows were drawn down over his intent old eyes in a heavy frown. What in the world's the matter? You all look as if I'd threatened to kill somebody. You're cutting a path through the wrath. Giles's voice was a little raised, so that all might hear the enormity proposed. Ellen flushed angrily now, and spoke, setting her pointed chin more decidedly into her vivid blue woollen scarf. Certainly I am. It's the quickest way to the links. Is there any reason why I should not? Everyone was listening intently now. Giles gave an odd laugh, still studying her under his shaggy brows. No, Missy, no real reason. But you shouldn't have try. You shouldn't have try. Why on earth? Ellen was getting both thoroughly ruffled and a little alarmed now. The old man sent a swift glance round at the circle of interested faces. Robin's wrath's never been touched, Missy. If you'll take an old man's advice, you'll leave it be. Robin's wrath's better as it is. Aye, aye, right enough, leave it be, miss. Better leave it be. A confused chorus of voices from the watching group, all gravely eyeing her, emphasised the old man's words, and with a quick angry shrug and laugh Ellen turned away, pushing the ends of her scarf into the front of her grey tweed jacket. Really, you're all talking nonsense. I shall do what I choose with the place. Sorry if it annoys you but I really see no sense in what you say against the idea of cutting a path through a piece of wild land. Good day. Her slim figure disappeared round the turn of the lane, and old Giles shrugged his shoulders as he took up his pipe again. No sense. Well, well. Happen she'll see sense before it is too late. Happen she mayn't. Then the Lord help her, for she's a pretty piece enough. Ellen Vandermill strode briskly along the narrow lane, still warm and flushed with annoyance at the recent little encounter. Her firm chin was set, and her dark eyes rather hard under their evenly marked brows. She was rather cross with herself also for becoming angry at what was, after all, a show of interest in her doings, which interest, up to that present, the villagers had been sadly devoid of, greatly to her vexation. She was quite determined to marry and settle down into an English country lady. The husband question could be settled later, though doubtless Papa would arrange that as easily as he had this, the purchase of the seat, wonderful Gill Hall. Ellen had beneath her greedy little modern tastes a genuine sense of the beautiful, and as she walked across the meadow path homewards, her eyes lighted with appreciation. The hall faced her. Far up the sloping side of the hill, backed by dark woods, and at the foot of the grounds, running into the lush water meadow that she was crossing, the wide, tangled woodland of Robin's Wrath. A long, narrow copse cut the grounds of the hall from the meadow like a dark ribbon of green wilderness. Usually Ellen took the twisting path that led round the end of the Wrath into the road that passed the hall gates, but now... Just at the bend she stopped, and, staring through the rough fence into the wrath, muttered something impatient to herself about the crass stupidity of the villagers. It would be so easy to cut a straight path through this. It couldn't be more than a hundred and fifty to two hundred yards across, and one walked straight into the meadow and thence to the links. Absurd, the ruddocks never doing it. Of course, the undergrowth was woefully thick and obviously hadn't been touched in centuries, but a couple of good men with billhooks would soon do the job. Suddenly, Ellen jumped. Against a dark tree trunk, only a few yards away, a man stood chewing a grass blade, hands in the pockets of his green corduroys, his eyes on her. Goodness! It annoyed Ellen to be surprised and she reflected with embarrassment that he must have been standing there all the time and overheard her irritable remarks about the villagers. He was only a keeper, probably, but it was none the less annoying to feel foolish, and Ellen's colour was considerably heightened when she spoke again. Here, who are you, and what are you doing on my land? 
The man removed the grass blade and spoke, one hand still in his pocket, and a pair of odd, quick eyes on her. His voice was rather brusque. Your land, eh, miss? Yes, mine. Her voice was brusquer, and the man laughed suddenly with a lazy amusement. Yours. Sorry, miss, I never knew. Don't look cross at me, missy. I'm only a keeper. Again the tone of lazy amusement, and, to her great vexation, Ellen found her colour rising again beneath the casual gaze of the stranger's eyes. True, he called her Miss, but somehow with a tone as if he found it rather amusing to do so. Before she could speak again, suddenly, with a quick, lithe mu movement, he was at the fence, his long brown hands near to hers. He wore a green leather cap, very damaged and old, pulled over his eyes, and his eyes were light brown, almost yellow, and quick and bright as a bird's. Come in, miss. You've never been in Robin's wrath yet. I'll go bail. Not for all you're cutting a pathway through it. Somehow, against her will, Ellen found herself scrambling over the fence and standing, a little breathless and scratched, on the other side. The man in green was but little taller, and they faced each other, feet deep in thick, tussocky grass. Ellen compressed her lips hard and clutched at her vanishing dignity. Somehow it seemed childish and puerile under the man's dancing eyes. But she stuck to her pose doggedly. Er, uh, no, I haven't had time to go through it. But if, as I suppose you are one of Sir George Ruddock's keepers, perhaps you had better show me the best place to cut a path down to the meadow. You are a keeper here, I suppose. The man in green was leading the way deep into the dusky heart of the wrath. Standing aside, he held a branch away as he replied, Yes, I'm a keeper here. Been here long enough, Missy. Longer than you'd think. How long? persisted the girl. The man's manner pricked her curiosity. He spoke the rough country dialect, certainly, but still with an air of engaging nonchalance, as if he did it on purpose. Was he a ruddock, come back in disguise to look after the lands of his father? Ellen's imagination, fed full on cinemas, French novels, and the yellow press of her country, ranged excitedly among a thousand dramatic possibilities. Turning to the man in green, changing her tactics, she found him looking down at her with a disconcerting little smile. She looked away, suddenly discomfited, and immediately exclaimed in astonished admiration, how lovely! They faced a narrow little glade, thick with bluebells. The blue flood ran like spilt colour about the trunks of the trees as far as eye could see. The dark tree trunks and the shiver of pale young leaves above their heads were speckled and splashed with golden flecks and pools and spangles. For an enchanted moment Ellen stared, then turned to the man in green, leaning negligently up against a tree. His rough suit almost wan with the mossy bark. He nodded, his eyes intent on hers. Yes, tis good enough, eh? And right here, Missy, is where you were going to cut the path. Tis the narrowest part of Robin's wrath. Ellen started. So this was it, was it? Another attempt on the part of those idiotic village people to influence her into leaving the wrath alone? Very cleverly done, she would admit, but what impertinence! Now, just to show them that she couldn't be dictated to, she would insist on having the path cut, though a moment ago she had been on the verge of changing her mind. Turning round, she laughed sharply, her chin in the air, and an acid remark on her tongue. But it died away unspoken, as she met the stranger keeper's odd light eyes. She felt somehow curiously embarrassed beneath the calm, quizzical gaze of this brown-faced fellow in the shabby green corduroys. Biting her lips, she tossed her pretty, spoiled head and caught back her dignity as lady of the manor. Her tone, as she spoke, was delicately condescending. Oh, really? Thank you for pointing it out. I must get some men to come and start work on it immediately. Do you happen to know a couple of good woodsmen? She congratulated herself that this was neat, to ask him to recommend the despoilers of the green wrath that obviously meant so much to him. 
The man laughed. His curly head, now bare of any covering, tilted back against the brown bark of the tree. Good wood men, eh? Who should know but I, who spent day and night these, well, more years than you'd think, Missy, in the green wrath? Oh, yes, I could tell you a woodman enough, but it might be they wouldn't suit you. They're old, and set in their ways now. No, no, they'd do a lot for me, but I wouldn't risk asking them to lay axe or billhook to Robin's wrath. Who are you? What is your name? Ellen asked suddenly, her puzzled eyes studying him. My name? Oh, my name is just Rob Woodson. Missy, but I've a lot of names. Happen if you ask the folk round here, they'd call me the Man in Green. A wren flew whistling fussily across the glade, and the man held up a brown hand. His lips pursed to a tiny, soothing note. To Ellen's great astonishment, the wee brown bird lighted on his outstretched finger, chirruping agitatedly in his face. He nodded, laughed, and, flinging up his long arm, threw the bird into the air. Forgetting her annoyance, Ellen spoke delightedly. Oh, can you tame them, really? I wish you would tame some for me. Her vain little mind was already visualizing a delicious picture of herself in white on the wide terrace of the hall, surrounded by tiny fluttering creatures taking crumbs from her hand, unafraid, and in the background a circle of admiring guests. The man in green looked down at her and laughed amusedly. Teach you, eh? It would take more than a lifetime to learn what I know about birds, miss. That little chap now, he's in a rare taking, him and his missus, for fear you cut the path. His nest's in an elderbrush right in the way, and she hadn't hatched her eggs yet. It's absurd to talk of birds in that way, as if they were human, said Miss Vandermill coldly, flushed and angry again now at the fresh introduction of the vexed question of the path. She moved away into the sun-patched bluebells, leaving a trail of crushed stalks and flattened blossoms behind her. Turning a haughty head over her shoulder, she nodded a patronizing goodbye to the strange keeper, who stood knee-deep in the blue flood beneath the trees, watching her silently. She jumped as he answered her unspoken thought. A right to do what you like with your own land, eh, Missy? Aye, that's fair. But think a minute. What's the name of this green wrath, anyway? Robin's wrath. The wrath of Robin. Well, well, isn't that enough? Wait till Robin tells you what he thinks of that path of yours cutting across his ground. Think it over, Missy, and come down and see the wrath again tomorrow. I'll be here, if you come to the wrath again tomorrow. The light, mocking voice died away behind her, as Ellen Vandermill hurried away. She flung a hasty glance over her shoulder as she scrambled out of the wrath into the wide, cool stretch of turf that swept up to the hall. The man in green had gone, and only the sunlight twinkled through the leaves across the tree trunk where he had been. Her aunt, Miss Eustasia Vandermill, met her in the hall and commented on the mess she had made of her smart tweed suit. Torn in two or three places it was, and bits of leaf and twig stuck to it still. Ellen raised annoyed eyebrows, and, slipping into another skirt, sat down to lunch, full of her adventure. Auntie, I had the most astonishing meeting this morning, coming up from the water meadow through Robin's wrath. Molly, the housemaid, a comely strapping girl, daughter of old Giles, was handing her the potatoes at the moment of speaking, and Ellen went on. Do keep the dish still, Molly. What's the matter with you? Well, I came through the wrath. Suppose that's why I've made such a mess of my tweed. The bushes can't have been cut for ages. There's not even a path. I shouldn't think anyone's even walked through it till I did. Absolutely wild it is. Lovely, of course, in a way. Well, said Auntie Eustasia, with mild impatience, is that all the adventure? Or is there some more? Molly, the potatoes, please. Well? Oh, no, there's a lot more. I met a strange man there, a keeper, he said he was. He said his name was Woodson, but he's not an ordinary keeper by any means. Rosie Molly's pink cheeks had suddenly faded to white, 
and she stood with her hands knotted together in her apron as she listened, her round blue eyes on her unconscious mistress, eating her cutlet daintily as she went on. I can't help thinking he's one of the ruddocks in disguise, or something of the sort. Oh, yes, he speaks with a funny accent, but I feel it's put on somehow. Like all these crazy villagers, he seems set against the idea of mine of cutting a path through the wrath to the lynx. It's such a good idea, too, commented Eustasia languidly. What reason did he give against it? Ellen laughed with a trace of asperity, remembering her old vexation over the subject. Oh, no reason at all. They none of them have. Only that it's never been done before. So English. As if that was a reason why it should never be done at all. I asked him to recommend two good woodmen, just out of sheer mischief, of course, as I knew he wouldn't. But he said those he knew were too old or something. What did you say his name was? Eustasia asked curiously. Woodson. Rob Woodson, he said, said Ellen. But he said that the people round here knew him best as the man in green. Crash. Both ladies jumped and exclaimed as Molly's shaking red hands let fall the fruit dish she was just placing on the table. Scolded, she had nothing to say but that she couldn't help it, and she was very sorry. The door closed on her downcast figure, and Ellen laughed vexedly. What a fool! Well, Auntie, I'm going to lie down for a while, and then I shall make you doll me up for tea. Don't forget the Anselms and Lady Craven are coming. The Anselms, Joe, Lily, and their mother, were very charming, as was Lady Craven, and tea was a complete success. Ellen looked charming in a vivid green frock, and accompanied Joe Anselm in several songs with great eclat. As an heiress, she was worth the county's cultivating, and certainly Ellen felt she stood on the threshold of her longed-for position in English society, as she walked down the well-kept drive with her guests. Lady Craven's car drove away, but the others were walking. It was a lovely spring evening, and Joe Anselm, good-looking and obviously rather intrigued with the pretty American. His mother, Lady Anselm, regarding possibilities with an amiably approving eye directed towards the paternal millions that would ultimately become Miss Vandermill's, suggested that Ellen should walk back part of the way at least to the village. A wrap and hat hastily donned, Ellen joined them, and the merry little group descended the steep, sloping lane to the village. Passing the end of Robin's Wrath, where it ran into the lane, Joe Anselm peered inside laughingly. "'Cut your famous path yet, Miss Vandermill?' "'No,' said Ellen, laughing. "'I'm going to very soon, though.' "'Find any difficulty in getting woodsmen?' asked Lily Anselm suddenly. Ellen's brow wrinkled. "'Well, I haven't taken any very special pains to find any yet, "'but now you speak of it, I believe I shall find it difficult. "'The villagers don't seem to like the idea of my cutting a path at all.' Lily glanced at her brother oddly. "'Yes, I don't think you'll get any of the local men to touch Robin's wrath, Miss Vandermill.' Ellen laughed vexedly. Here, again, even the aristocrats were casting cold water on her scheme. She answered with a touch of height and colour. "'If they won't, I shall have some men over from Brailing or Little Witchet. But why in the world this extraordinary reluctance to have Robin Raths touched, even you?' Joe nodded, colouring a trifle. I wouldn't, Miss Vandermill, really, I wouldn't. I'd leave the wrath as it is. Ellen's temper, never too easy, suddenly snapped. This is too idiotic. Really? Why? Lily came to the rescue of her brother. It's nothing, really, Miss Vandermill, only a sort of story that the village people believe. We don't, but anyway, one of the Ruddocks once tried to clear Robin's wrath and make it into a wild garden. Joe's glance held his sister's, and she stopped suddenly, to Ellen's great annoyance. Well, what happened? Lily was silent, but Joe answered, guardedly. And they stopped, and they never finished it. Something stopped them. Good heavens, what? Ellen's tone was frankly scornful, and the young man winced, but answered her unmoved. I don't know, but nobody touches Robin's wrath. The villagers say, without some awful misfortune. What rot! In her relieved indignation, Ellen was none too polite. 
Really, Mr. Anselm, I thought you were more sensible. Anyway, it's safe enough to human beings, for I met one of Sir George Ruddock's old keepers there only this morning, and he was all right, said he spent all his time there. Joe's eyebrows were wrinkled, puzzled. Keeper? Thought all old Ruddock's keepers left when, when the hall was sold. What sort of a man was he? He says his name is Woodson, said Ellen. As to what he looks like, well, he's tall and brown-faced, dressed in green. At that moment they stopped at the door of the village store, where Ellen was to say good-bye to them. Lady Anselm and her three dogs were a little behind, and the brother and sister stood silent, regarding Miss Vandermill. There was a faint pause, and they looked at each other. Lily spoke softly, her voice oddly hushed. "'We know who you mean, now. No, we've never seen him, but you have. You've seen the man in green.' "'Good-bye, Miss Vandermill. Oddly silent, the two strode away. Round the bend of the road they looked at each other again, and Lily's eyes were frightened. "'Joe! Oh, Joe, what can we do? She's seen him. And do you remember Andrew? Andrew persuaded Jim Ruddock to try and clear the wrath, and, and Andrew saw him.' Joe's freckled face twitched in painful memory of Andrew Sterling, his chum, first in all sports, bright and brave and handsome, and of that faint shadow of the Andrew they had known that had been found sprawling, half dead, at the edge of the wrath one awful morning. With a jerk he brushed the memory away and replied, We can't do anything, Lily. We've done our best, and everybody's tried to warn her, but she's a willful, spoiled little specimen, and I'm afraid it's useless. We can't. Nobody can, you know it say more than we have already done. One can only warn her as best we can, and hope she'll take it. Next morning was, if anything, lovelier than before, and Ellen's little soul expanded beneath the life-giving sunlight, as she wandered about the lovely old house and grounds, planning fresh alterations, improvements everywhere. Her restless American mind, over-modern, unable to let anything alone, but must forever be tinkering with it, altering, experimenting, fairly purred in its pleasure at having this gorgeous piece of the old world to play with. The immense expanse of jade-green turf that swept down from the hall windows to the distant wrath was to be cut up into flower-beds and a pergola. Two new tennis courts were to be laid down, thereby sacrificing an old walled garden that had stood for over three hundred years, a huge and wonderful oak that happened unfortunately to shade her bedroom windows too heavily, was to go, and endless other alterations. "'Good morning to you, Missy.' The man in green stood with his arms folded along the top of the rough fence that divided the wrath from the grounds. "'Oh, good morning.' Ellen was confused for a moment. Why, she wondered, had she come wandering down to the wrath again, all unconsciously? The man in green laughed, suddenly, amusedly. "'You came because you said you would, of course. Now, now, no cross looks this wonderful morning. I know you never said so in words. Why, come over again, then, and we can talk in the wrath together. Just we two.' Rob Woodson's voice was seductive, warm as the spring sunshine that flooded Miss Vandermill's bare head where she stood, a few feet away from the fence. Her eyes puzzled, half-dazed, half-frightened. She answered rather vaguely, her eyes on his merry, light brown orbs, twinkling at her beneath the pulled-down brim of his green cap. Why, I... of course I was coming. I, I meant to come. The fence was high and the green, tangled undergrowth of the wrath a few feet lower than the smooth, shaven lawn that met it. One doubtful hand on the fence, Ellen looked at the man in green questioningly. Pulling aside a slat or two, he made room for her feet to mount. Then, as she balanced precariously on the top, stepped back and laughed, a full-throated gust of merriment that brought tears of vexation to the girl's eyes. At the sight, the man in green stopped at once and came forward, his brown eyes suddenly tender behind their elfish laughter. "'That was too bad, little lady.' His voice was low and beautiful, 
and his arms were held out to her where she balanced on top of the fence level with his shoulders. Let yourself go now. Into my arms. Obediently, she sank forward into the arms held ready to receive her, and her head went down on his shoulder with a little tremulous sigh of happiness as his warm lips found hers. With the girl curled close in his arms, his head bent to hers, he turned swiftly into the heart of the wrath, and the green closed over them. Miss Eustasia Vandermill kept lunch till almost two o'clock, and then, just as she was beginning to be seriously agitated, Ellen stepped into the dining-room through the open French window. Her eyes were wide and dazed, but her mouth was tremendously red, and she broke into a little running laugh of happiness at her aunt's grim face of disapproval. Coming forward, she kissed the old lady. To the latter's great astonishment, Ellen was never in the habit of kissing people, especially relations. "'Well, I'd begun to give you up, Ellen, and mercy! What have you done to yourself?' Eustasia's restless old hands were picking leaves, bits of moss, and twigs from the girl's tumbled hair and skirt. But Ellen twitched away, and, seizing an apple, declared she was not hungry. Molly eyed her furtively, with a sort of terrified interest, as she served the older woman's meal. But Ellen's eye was absent as she munched, and she never noticed— Lily Anselm, striding down to the village later, met Molly on her afternoon out, and the two stopped. Molly had been in service with the Ruddocks and known Lily and her brother since babyhood. The village girl's usually rosy cheeks were pale again today, and she seized on Lily with feverish urgency. Oh, Miss Lily, I don't know how to say it, but I'm so scared I can sleep a night I'm and tell you. What is it? Lily said though her own paling cheeks showed kinship with a fear that whitened the other's ruddiness. They stood near the wrath, and Molly dropped her voice as she spoke. "'It's—it's it's the same coming as came to Muster Andrew. Oh, miss, I couldn't bear it. Father, he tried to warn her and all, and she wouldn't see. She wouldn't see. Messing with the wrath and all. Do you mind, oh, Muster Andrew would say he met the man in green?' The girl was nearly crying, and Lily patted her arm soothingly. "'Don't worry, Molly. Perhaps it'll be all right. Anyway, we've all tried to warn her. We can't do any more. If I were to tell her just the truth, she would laugh. Besides, you know one can't. Something stops it every time.' There was a crackling of elder bushes above them, where the wrath ran up to a steep bank, and a wren flew out, chattering indignantly almost as if he had been thrown out to startle the girls. With a scared little cry, Molly took to her heels, and Lily, her young lips compressed, strode on towards the village. As she turned the bend in the path past the wrath that led into the water meadow, it seemed she heard a faint laugh somewhere deep in the green tangle of bramble and hawthorn and wild rose. Lily's steps were no slower for that, for she was thinking of Andrew, as he used to be, and as he was, when the wrath had done with him. The next two weeks were anxious ones for Miss Eustasia. Ellen, she thought, was suffering from some form of nerves. While she lost no interest in the house and grounds, and directed the workmen energetically in the alterations, she was given to sudden, inexplicable absences from the house, sometimes in daytime, but more often now about dusk and, as the month was approaching its zenith, and the fat, honey-coloured spring moon waxing larger each night, the evening saw her less and less with her aunt. She came back from these expeditions faintly flushed, with eyes like stars, and an unwanted sweetness about her like a magic cloak, but, for all that, distraught and absent, and with the vaguest possible explanations— all she would say was that she had been wandering in the wrath. At last her aunt grew suspicious of the mysterious man in green, and one day interrogated Molly. The latter flushed and paled suddenly and averred with a furtive glance towards the wrath, sleeping in the warm, pale afternoon sun, that the keeper was all right, she'd heard. Was he well known? Well, yes. Been here a long time. Couldn't tell how long. Maybe years and years. Yes. 
known him herself? Why, no, ma'am. "'Twas a bit of cold making her shiver like that. Couldn't help it like. No, she'd heard tell of him often, though. Happened that was all the ma'am wanted?' Satisfied, Miss Eustasia cast about for another reason, but found none, and at that moment Ellen stepped into the room from the garden, trailing a branch of bramble behind her, her dark hair starred wet with dew-wet convolvuli. She took no notice of her aunt, but stood with her face pressed against the cold pane, staring out into the slowly darkening garden, towards the wrath. Miss Eustasia spoke sharply. Really, Ellen, you might at least, when you do condescend to come in, take a little trouble to be pleasant. I get very little of your company these days. Ellen smiled faintly, and came over to her aunt, laying a slender arm scented with pines and bracken across the old lady's thin shoulders. Poor Auntie, never mind. I am very happy, happier than I knew it was possible to be. What's worrying you anyway, dear? The old lady bit off a thread of silk, viciously. Just this, my dear. You're not leading a healthy life, mooning about by yourself these days. What happened to your golf that you were so keen on? Young Anselm came over yesterday to ask you to play, and you were away somewhere. Ellen laughed. Now, as it always did sooner or later, the vaguely dreamy mood began to wear off, and the old Ellen, bright, poised and self-sufficient was speaking. That all? Dear me, I'll write him at once and suggest a day next week. She moved to the writing table and opened the blotter as she spoke. Eustasia finished off a flower of her embroidery emphatically as she began again. That reminds me. Have you done anything about that path through the wrath? It's too silly for you to go a quarter of a mile round by the road, when with a little trouble you could have that path cut. Ellen's brow was wrinkled, almost as if she tried to catch a fleeting, though half-forgotten thought. Oh, yes, I'd somehow forgotten that. I suppose it'd better be done. It seems difficult to get men here, though. Perhaps I'd better leave it. Rubbish, the old lady snapped. Now you're riding right to that firm at Little Witchet we passed in the car the other day, and tell them to send three or four men. Today's Friday. Say they had better come on Monday. The room fell silent, save for the faint scratching of Miss Vandermill's pen on the paper. It was getting dark very rapidly, thought Miss Eustasia, and what a nuisance that strand of ivy tapping against the pane was. Odd that she, who was so sensitive to irritating noises, had never noticed it before. Sitting back, Ellen sealed up both envelopes and slipped them into her pocket. The tapping of the ivy seemed to have worried her, too, for she opened the window and broke the trail off, impatiently flinging it into the garden. Stretching out her arms, she yawned and laughed. "'Well, that's done.' Funny how I came to put off writing about that path these last two weeks. Quite unlike my usual business-like ways. Papa always said I had the head of a businessman. Now he'd have laughed to see me wandering for hours about a damp wood. Her laughter was frankly amused. And it was the old Ellen that glanced down into her aunt's eyes. Cool, self-reliant, dominating. Miss Eustasia patted her hand. Glad to see you more like yourself again, dear. I admit that craze of yours for perpetually exploring the wrath worried me a little. What made you take to doing it now? A faint, puzzled crease crossed the girl's white forehead, and at the moment a belated wren fluttered against the rising wind past the window, cheeping feebly. Ellen passed her hand across her brow worriedly, then dropped it and laughed lightly. I really couldn't possibly say, dearest, I, I can't think now why I did it. Just a whim, I suppose. Now I'm going up to dress for dinner. Come along. It seemed to Miss Eustasia afterwards that never had Ellen been so bright and like her usual sparking self at that last dinner time. The idle, dreaming Ellen of the last two weeks seemed to have vanished like snow in spring, and thankfully Eustasia mentally composed another letter to Papa Vandermill that should set his mind completely at rest concerning his willful daughter, whose insistence on the purchase of the hall had worried him considerably. 
They had coffee in the pretty drawing room, and Ellen played. Bright, crisp, ragtime music, sharply contrasted to her recent craze for Sibelius, Dvorak, and Ravel. There was a small fire, for the storm had fulfilled its promise, and the bright rain spattered the long panes persistently, while a chilly little wind forced its way through the chinks of the curtains. The evening passed peacefully, and at last Miss Eustasia, who had been nodding steadily before the fire for the last half hour, rose and yawned, putting her eternal embroidery together. Well, you play delightfully, dear, but I think it's about time for bed, don't you? Are you coming? Ellen shook her head, her fingers still wandering absently over the keys. No, not yet. Very soon, I think. Good night, dear. The door closed behind the old lady, and Ellen's hands fell from the keys. There was that tiresome ivy again, tapping. It must be another piece. Tomorrow she would have the whole thing cut away. It was maddening, this eternal tapping. Settling herself into a chair by the fire with a book, she tried to read. But the tapping proved too distracting, and at last, with an impatient exclamation, she got up and went to the window. Pulling aside the curtain, she gave a sudden gasp of terrified astonishment. Pressed against the panes, his long-nailed fingers playing a tattoo on the glass, his light eyes gleaming luminously in the light, stood the man in green. Beckoning, he retreated and vanished in the dark, wind-tossed trees. Mechanically, with no thought of refusal, she fetched a cloak from the hall, and stepping out into the whirl of wind and rain, went steadily down the dark garden. The moon was full, but ragged clouds sailing across it obscured its light except for occasional glimpses. There was a faint growl of thunder in the distance, and the gusts of sharp wind flapped and buffeted her, flinging showers of heavy drops upon her uncovered hair from the overhanging trees. In the open the light rain stung her face like tiny needles. A sob rose in her throat as with wide, fixed, bright eyes she pressed steadily on down the sloping lawn to the waiting wrath. Her mind was vaguely wandering down half-forgotten paths. She had been made one with the wrath, received into its arms, though someone, but who she had forgotten, the keeper? But, of course, she had always known he was no keeper. Who was he? Never mind. It didn't matter, and she couldn't remember anything clearly, only that there in the wrath she had known joy unspeakable, lain with her cheek pressed against the grass and bracken, played, so long ago it seemed, with rabbit and wren and chaffinch, unfearingly, friendly, with someone's arm about her, drunk of its tiny stream, decked her hair with its flowers, the wrath had received her, and she had turned upon it and stabbed it to the heart by a letter, a cruel letter that even now lay in the pocket of the coat she wore. Now she was going to meet her just punishment. With dark eyes wide and vague, she stumbled down the last steep grass slope and stopped, panting heavily against the fence. Across the top the keeper leant, regarding her strangely from beneath his pulled-down cap, shiny with rain. She noticed dully that a spraying trail of ivy hung from his buttonhole, and idly wondered why. The brown hands of the man in green were clasped, loosely together along the top of the fence, and with a sudden sick remembrance she thought again of the first time she had seen them thus. The wind whistled and roared, rising to a gale around them, and in a lull she heard Rob Woodson speak. So you have come to the wrath again, little lady, to the wrath for the last time. His tone was light, half laughing, but a faint cold hint of menace rang through it, and his odd, luminous eyes regarded her curiously as she stood there, plucking unthinkingly at the moss on her fence, 
her dark curly hair whipped to a halo about her head, those beautiful eyes regarding him dully. Her mouth quivered suddenly, piteously, as she replied, Yes, I have come for the last time. What, what are you going to do with me? Through the vaguely hypnotized look in her eyes crept a real gleam of fear, and she shivered involuntarily as he stretched out a long hand in invitation, patting the place where the broken slat still spoke so vividly of that wonderful day two weeks ago. Or was it two hundred years? He smiled at her, shrinking in nameless terror on the other side. You have been made free of the wrath, fair Ellen. Why do you fear it? She raised tortured eyes to him, dumbly, as his smile broadened, eyes narrowing as he watched her terror-stricken face. Grim fear held her in an icy grip, and feebly she fought with all that was left her of sanity to resist. But his eyes were merciless. Trembling, she mounted the fence, and as she balanced on the top, suddenly, swiftly, he held out his arms to her, his head flung back, laughing, a slant moonbeam gleaming on his light, cruel eyes, mocking triumphant, inhuman. Come, let go, and come to my arms, pretty maiden. Fall, fall, you know what no other woman has known, and must die for knowing. Come to me. With a shouting rush and flurry of wind, with a beating of rain about her, the last shred of resistance fled from the girl as she fell forward, and dimly through the gathering mist she heard the voice of the man in green above her, through the wild howling of the gale that rocked the groaning trees, light, joyous, triumphant, as his lips closed on hers. The wrath has received you, maiden, and the wrath rejects you. In this my last kiss on your human lips, For I, Rob Woodson, son of the woods, I am Robin, and this is my wrath. A few months later the hall was up for sale, And rebought by Sir George Ruddock, Sorely repentant at ever having sold the house of his fathers. So the Ruddocks came back to Gill, and the pretty American faded into a mere story, whispered to terrifying ears on winter's evenings. But far across the sea, in bustling New York, an anxious father goes from specialist to specialist with a lovely, dark-eyed girl, once bright, alert, vivacious, now blank and dull, half-witted almost, with the springs of her vivid womanhood dried up and dead within her. Now and then she gets restless and cries a little, on a wet spring night, and always she has ivy and green things of the wood and water in her room, but generally she goes through life smiling vaguely, gentle, silent, and empty of soul as a doll. Indeed, as one great specialist said to another aside, too low for the agonized father to hear, she is as much mentality as a china doll, no use to anyone, he ever any more. Some shock must have killed the spring of vitality, but I wonder what it was. He may well wonder, since Ellen Vandermill is the only one who knows, and she can only drift through life smiling at nothing, silent, with her womanhood dead within her since Robin Goodfellow kissed the soul away from her one stormy night, long ago, in a green glade, in England. Robin's Wrath The Wrath of Robin I'd never heard the word wrath R-A-T-H, that is, until I read this story. 
So I did what I normally do and looked it up. And a rath is a circular enclosure surrounded by an earthen wall used as a dwelling and stronghold in former times. So we're talking about some kind of green oasis enclosed by a wall. Now, this story is set a while ago, maybe a hundred years back. So I wondered if places like this still exist today. Then I thought back to my time in England. I lived there for the better part of a decade in the early 90s. My wife and I would sometimes jump in the car and just drive around, taking unknown streets and lanes and back ways. We'd see a lot of beautiful greenery, unguessed at pubs nestled away, fields, stone houses, all terribly rustic and lovely, like places that time forgot. And then, when we'd had our fill, we'd jump onto a major road and discover that we were closer to home than we thought, home in maybe 15 minutes. Where I live now, in Melbourne, Australia, there is a wealth of natural beauty not far away. The Dandenong Ranges, the Yarra Valley, Phillip Island, the Royal Botanic Gardens, Treasury Gardens, towns like Olinda. These are not raths, but they all have their own type of natural beauty and help us connect with nature and with each other. They're all lovely oases, whatever shade of green they wear. And the green man is said to be present in all of these places, whatever shade of green he wears. In countryside England, I'm sure he looks like he does in this story. Green corduroys, green leather cap, light brown eyes. Elsewhere, he might be different. He might wear fewer clothes. He may be ritually tattooed. He might carry ancient weapons made from the trees themselves. He may not be a he. But one thing is certain. Robin's wrath is closer than you think. Pseudopod Towers exists in several states at once, fully formed, partially ruined, triumphantly rebuilt after being raised by the denizens of an alternate reality. It can be hard to find your way around. The effort to map the place is continuous and we keep losing the map makers, so your generous gifts are very necessary. For those of you who already donate to us, we thank you warmly and deeply. If you don't, you can donate regularly via Patreon or PayPal, or make a one-off donation via PayPal. The link for all of these are on our website, pseudopod.org. Otherwise, or even as well, help spread the word about Pseudopod. We've been telling tales for more than a decade. We have a wealth of stories to share. Let others know that these stories are there, free. For anyone to listen to. Take a moment to look back through the back catalogue yourself. You're sure to find something that'll stroke that very particular horror craving of yours. We will be back next week with Muse by Sarah Gribble. Pseudopod is part of Escape Artists Incorporated and is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Theme music is used with the permission of Anders Manga. See you next week. Until then, Pseudopod knows when to leave the ancient places be. It's a pseudopod, it's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.